All right. Uh, I am getting this uh, live thing started up. Um, we are about 20 minutes to uh, before the class starts. So if you're watching this now, you're probably watching this later. Um, but if you're watching now, you're really quick. Um, I'm going to get this all posted up here. But first, I'm just going to put a little, uh, let's see, how does this work? I get on the Zoom. And then I, we're alive right now, just so you know. <clears throat> so don't say anything disparaging about it. <laughs> so and so, such as so and so. Um, and uh, let's see, share a screen. I, I'll give that to you in a second. I'm just putting up a little. Oh wait. I'm just putting up a little thing here, so that uh, yeah, there we go. And then I'm gonna play a little hold music because why not? set up like posting links to the website and, and to Facebook and all that jazz. So uh, right now but yeah the people who watch this later people are like uh, if anyone's watching now that's what we're doing. We need to skip ahead to twenty minutes later and come back. <clears throat> or you can just watch me, I mean wherever ports you go.
Red, if anybody's watching right now, we are two, two people. Maybe one here. If anyone's watching right now, we are just setting things up, and we will be live at five. Live at five. Live at five. Live at five. See you then. Enjoy this beautiful music. All right. See you soon.
Yeah, they probably won. Hello. You still got, still got a five or six minutes before we start. It looks like there's some people already watching, or they're just ghosting. Um, we are in our bedroom this time, um, which we did for the last um, happy hour. And we did that because the reception seems to be better in here. So that's why we did that. So uh, there's the books behind us, um, which used to be in our living room, but uh, long story short, we just moved them in here. Um, but we're not started for another five minutes. We should crack these beers open, huh? No. Not yet? You have to wait? Aren't you, you going to talk about them? You have to wait. Not yet. It's before. That's what I mean. Yeah, we got to talk about them first. <clears throat> Guess we got to wait. <clears throat> There's only four people watching right now anyway, because uh, it's early. Um, yeah, so if you're watching this, yeah, uh, and you're watching, the, if you're watching this later, which a lot of you will be, uh, you know, just go to the 20 minute mark and you will start the class. Um, yeah, just watch me dance. Look pretty. You want that light on? Yeah, lighting. Cause it's gonna get dark in here. Shit. I mean, oops. Jeez. <laughs> Golly. Golly. Gee whiz. That look. Uh, yes, it's okay. Someday we'll get some professional lighting. Huh. Ooh, six people are watching right now. <laughs> For those of you who just joined, we haven't started yet. But uh, yeah, message us if anything's weird, if our if the audio's off or uh, if it's freezing up. Um, there's some weird noises in the background. That's uh, Katie feeding the dogs. Uh, just let us know if anything's weird. Should be good. I think our connection's all right. All right, four minutes, T minus three or four minutes or so. So uh, we'll see you in a bit. We're almost ready. Two minutes. Now I was gonna try to set this up so we can live on Insta. Ooh, crazy. We are, uh, who's watching you? We got, we got some people in here. Hi guys, we are just setting up and we will be uh, live soon. Um, so just hang on.
Yeah, I'm dancing. You just hit. Here we go. Oh, you got to hold it now. Hmm. Try this, huh? Eight people. Hello, eight people. Hello. <clears throat> Um, T minus one, one minute. <laughs> Let me do this one last thing. All right. Uh, oh, it's five o'clock. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the uh, the first class of 2021. Last week didn't count because that was just a, um, a a plant geek happy hour or whatever we called it. Um, <laughs> and but this class is on uh, the acanthaceae. Um, so let me um, do this really quick. How's everybody doing? Did y'all get, do y'all have, um, oops, y'all have something to drink? Let's see what people are saying. Someone says, hello. Huh. Hi, hey, hi Joe, Joe Curry. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so um, <clears throat> we're getting ready to drink here too. Let's, let's pop open. Teacher needs uh, well, some. Hang on. Let's, let's, let's talk about this. <clears throat> All right, Katie, get in here and talk about it. Come on in with me. Ow. Don't put it on me, yo. Scooch in here. I'm gonna scooch out real fast. <laughs> um, so uh, this week, um, our libation is provided by Tap and Bottle. And slash Westbound. Slash Westbound. Um, both the same owners, if you didn't know that. Um, the beer that they've... Um, provided for us this so generously this uh, week is called El Jefe. And if you look on the back of there, you can see this Tap and Bottle Arizona Wilderness and EXO. Um, those are the collaborators who made this beer. Um, so it's a um, sort of like a blonde, but it has chiltepine and sweet orange in it. Um, and by sweet orange, I presume that they mean Arizona sweet oranges. Um, and uh, so the Arizona Wilderness Brewing is in Phoenix. Um, they're a local Arizona brewer. Um, XO Coffee, you should know XO. They're, they're really great too. And in fact, we drink XO just about every day. And we drink Tap and Bottle just about every day. Um, and so, and Tap and Bottle, of course, is a tap and bottle shop um, where you can get uh, beer from and wine uh -huh. and Westbound which is in the west side of town here, kind of close to our house. We're, we're at a mountain um, in Menlo Park. They're at the, what's it called? The Annex. The Annex. The MSA Annex. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's similar to Tap and Bottle, but different. They actually have um, um, liquors as well as wine and beer. That's it's, where we've been getting a lot of our cool spirits that's right. lately. Yeah. <clears throat> um, what do we know about this beer? um well we know that it's oh no i'm gonna say things wrong that's okay um uh shoot the nonprofit. uh the jaguar project right the jaguar project it's um, called el jefe after a jaguar that they found in 2011 first time in 2011 and it was in, in the whetstones yeah um, and they had a contest, I think, at a local elementary school, and they named him El Jefe. El Jefe. Um, and I think he was continuously spotted in the Santa Ritas until 2015. And we haven't seen him since. They haven't seen him since. They're guessing he went back to Mexico, hopefully, fingers crossed. Yeah, hopefully he's in Sonora, where the rest of them are, and he's, he's getting it on and making some kittens. <laughs> um, but the Chiltepines are, they are from... Well, the Jaguar oh, right. project picks them. <clears throat> I need to know more about this. Some, somewhere in Sonora. And then um, Pivot Produce actually brought them up, or the Jaguar project brought them up, and yeah. Pivot distributes them too. But right. um, Arizona Wilderness got them, worked with them through Pivot, I think. 
So if you guys um, don't know Pivot Produce, they're a local produce company. You can get. Um, they're doing local CSAs, CSA. right now. Yeah. Um, um, they also sell at um, various. Um, well, they used to be at farmers markets. Oh, we don't do those anymore. <laughs> they used to hard. Remember to farmers by. markets? I think uh, they still happen. Yeah, maybe they do. Yeah. Um, some of them do anyway. But anyway, uh, Pivot's really great. They they provide a lot of um, produce to restaurants as well and to various chefs and and, and et cetera. Um, so they're great. So this is a lot of people uh, went into this beer. So let's drink it. Yeah. It's like, let's and stop this, talking about it. In non-COVID times, this would have been a collaboration where EXO and Tap and Bottle may have gone up to Arizona Wilderness and helped brew this beer. So, but COVID times. Yeah. You hear a cat in the background, that's Ansel. That's our El Jefe. That's our El Jefe. <laughs> He's a big poofy gray cat that we got several years ago and um, He's pretty great. So, but this is a really nice light beer, um, almost Hefeweizen, but blondish. Um, yeah, not Hefeweizen has, in yeast, but definitely Hefeweizen like. Yeah, in that, in that sort of citrus. And then it's got a little, mm. a little heat, not a lot, but just that nice chili flavor and. Like a sparkle on the tongue. Like a little sparkle of heat. So mm. go and check it out. You can get it at Tap and Bottle and Westbound. Um, yeah. Definitely try it. It's, it's really nice. And yes, Joe Curry, it is cold. <laughs> We're serving it cold. We did have it in the fridge before now. Um, yeah, so anyway, it's I love this beer, and we drink a lot of um, IPAs, and, and uh, well, we drink a little of everything, but we probably drink IPAs more than anything, right? Yeah. Lately, anyways. Um, I'm not a blonde beer guy, but this is a really good beer. It has, like, almost a, I mean, this you can definitely smell the citrus when you first smell it, and um, and the chilled cream gets that little bite, but it's also got this, like, um, it's almost like a vanilla flavor and I don't know where that comes from but it's really good it's delicious so anyway that's what we're drinking cheers um, cheers everybody so let's do a cheers um um these are class objectives and the first one is to toast the wild planet the wild side of the planet too so this toast goes out to all the wild things that have nothing to do with human beings and let's hope that they make it through our um, anthropocene and uh that something's alive after us jerks more jaguars in the sonoran desert yeah cheers one more time for that. cheers tap for the dead Ooh. don't forget all right so today's class um <laughs> look like you scoot out <laughs> and goodbye <laughs> uh today's class um basically what we're going to do in this class is uh we're going to go over some botany and don't be scared. We're not going to dig too deep. I'm not. We're not going to make you memorize anything. But we're going to do a little botany. We're going to go overview some of uh, the plants in this family, <clears throat> and the family itself. Some of its famous relatives, um, and um, and any questions you have along the way, please ask. We're going to. But most of this is a profile of plants, and the reason I wanted to do it is a is in in the context of a family is that I want to get people thinking about the, the, you know, plants in groups. Um, so some of you who wonder like, how do, how do some of us, um, <laughs> Ansel, um, how do, how do some of us remember so many plant names? Um, you don't need to, by the way, but the reason that we do remember them is that it's not a random thing. Like we don't store just a, a random bunch of names in our head. It's a hierarchical, almost index system. So it's easy to remember because it's organized. And that's, that's a good way to learn plants. And even if you don't learn the traits um, that describe acanthaceae in this class, it's, it doesn't matter. What I want you to know is that, excuse me, um, is that plants are related and um and just know that these can these plants are kind of somewhat related that they're evolutionarily related they have a common ancestor and and uh, and uh and that's what taxonomy is all about botanical names aren't um random and although there's not too many uh terrible name changes in this family um, a lot of people do ask why they, they change the names all the time <clears throat> and it can be frustrating 
because, you know, especially for, uh, you know, horticulturists get really annoyed. And when I say horticulturists, I mean, as opposed to, to botanists. Botanists study wild plants and they study plants um, scientifically. Horticulturists are people who grow plants and um, they usually work in plant nurseries. Um, they get the most annoyed, uh, I think more than anyone because they, they have to deal with the public too. And the public is always the last to learn all the new, new names. Um, but we're really big on just getting people to, to know um, the names. And even if you don't remember the names or memorize them, we just want you to understand why they're there because it is important. It's something, you know, we don't do this randomly as botanists. We do it because we're trying to reflect uh, how things are related. Um, that tree looking thing there is a sort of, um, is a, uh, a representation of like how plants are related. <clears throat> so you see down there in the bottom is lycopods, which is like a fern relative kind of thing. I think we only have a, one or two lycopods that maybe show up in Arizona, but and not very, I, I've never seen a lycopod in Arizona. Um, and then the ferns you see on the on the left there is a lower branch. And then you see a little bit hard, farther up, you see the gymnosperms. That's going to be pines and cycads and um, ephedra and stuff like that, ginkgo. Um, <clears throat> and then you start to get into the flowering plants and you can see the monocots split off there. Monocots are grasses and agaves and stuff. The bigger, the bigger uh, group there is going to be, of course, flowering plants. And um, but anyway, the, the point of this illustration is just to show you um, that plants aren't just random. They didn't, they didn't, they weren't just, you know, <clears throat> sorry to people who believe this, but they weren't created by some guy up there like, oh, I made this and there it is. And they evolved from each other. And if there is a, a G-O-D, uh, then that G-O-D uh, made evolution create plants. So uh, whatever. We know evolution's real. We've seen it. Um, I've seen it in my lifetime. Um, what we do know about plants now, um, and the reason that a lot of botanical names change, um, it comes from our ability to look at their genes. So now we can look at their genes and say, oh yeah, we used to think this thing was related over here, but now it's, it's over here. So that's why names change. Um, and um, let's see, there's some groups that are worse than others. Um, groups that are newer in the evolutionary um, uh, in the evolutionary tree there, um, the newer groups usually have more, um, there's a lot more hybridization and, and evolution still happening. So there's a lot more species. Cacti, orchids are good examples. Um, agaves, uh, there's a lot of plants that, that freely hybridize. And then also plants that um, humans are, tend to be involved with uh, are hybridizing fast because we hybridize them. Um, so cacti are a mess taxonomically. Agaves are a mess because half the time we don't, we have, you know, we have agaves that we don't know where they came from because of colonialism. Um, so anyway, uh, there's that. <clears throat> um, I threw this in here. This is not an acanth, but uh, it's funny that all these names change to reflect evolutionary relationships and to make our vision more clear. And for some reason, some of the rules that have been set um, have kept names around that we probably should have gotten rid of. This is jojoba and it's called Simonsia chinensis. What does chinensis mean? It means it's from China. We know that jojoba is not from China. What happened? Why did this name get stuck to jojoba? Um, back in the day when botanists used to be in their colonial palaces or wherever the hell they were in their royal botanical gardens, they would get sent plants from all over the world. You know, when, uh, when us white people were going around rape, raping and pillaging the world and uh, we'd send plants back to the botanists in, in, in England and wherever else in Spain and whatever. And somebody named this chinensis because I think it was like the, the, the story is that two packages got mixed up and one thing was from China, got labeled as from Arizona desert and vice versa. And so this plant got called Simonsia chinensis. And the old rule is that the first person to name the species, that species name sticks. So even if the genus names change, the only way the species names change is if the genus name change and, and there's another plant named the same thing in that genus, then they'll change the species name, but otherwise they won't change it. And that's just the rules. And this, 
it, most of the time it works out well because it means that like the names don't change as often as they could. But in this case, you kind of wish it did because like Simonzio chinensis, bummer. All right. Um, there's also some changes that are going to freak people out <laughs> and they're continue to freak people out. And there's a, there's a new one. This, that's a Sansevieria, right? So if you know Sansevieria or mother-in-law tongue, well, snake plant. snake plant. Yeah. They're all, uh, Dracenias now. And, um, and so they've been assigned to that group of plants. It's in the agave, um, branch of the asparagus family. So, um, <clears throat> So we, um, we've seen, uh, you know, these dramatic name changes can really freak people out, especially growers. Like those growers are like, I'm not going to call that Dracenia. And you don't have to, you can call this Sansevieria. Um, if you go onto our webpage and look at the cactus and succulent, the succulent section, Sansevieria is in there. And we call it Sansevieria, even though in the notes you read, you read about it and says, this is now Dracenia, but we didn't want to freak people out. So <laughs> Uh, but that's happening. So there's that. You don't have to use the new names. You don't even have to remember botanical names. What we want you to just understand is that things are related and, um, and there's a purpose to their names. So cool. I haven't lost anyone yet. Um, <laughs> and so um, anyway, uh, let's get on to the, the acanthaceae, the subject of this class. So um, there are 210 genera. Gen a genus, you know, genera is plural, genus is singular. There are four, around 4,000 species of acanthaceae. They're mostly in, um, the majority of them are in the New World, but there's acanths in the Mediterranean and, and there's some in Asia. Um, they're, they're almost always tropical or subtropical. And believe it or not, we live in a subtropical region. Um, we think of this place as a desert, but when you really start looking at the flora and you know, a lot about this um, area, you realize we live in a subtropical area, an arid subtropical area, but, but an arid, but uh, uh, subtropical. Um, it's named after this plant, which we're going to go into, the bear's breech or Acanthus mollis. Um, by the way, uh, acanths are, it's a very wide group. There's even some trees. Um, most, most of them are perennial plants. Um, there's even some aquatic plants. Um, there's some annuals. The majority of them are, are perennial shrubby kind of plants. Um, so if you saw the, uh, this, this image, um, forget the trombone picture. We just picked that because it was random and funny. Um, but what is that Greek column doing there? Does anyone think, did anyone see that and like wonder like what's that about? Or do they just think that was part of the pool? I don't know. We threw that in there on purpose. Um, Corinthian columns were based off of an acanth, a famous acanth, and that was the one we just saw, Acanthus mollis, um, which the whole family is named after that plant. Um, and so the Corinthian columns were, were designed, to so people who have studied um, classics or if you studied architecture, this is like really important, like, like Greek architecture was mimicked years and years later too, and they use these same images, um, for for hundreds and and, thou, and thousands of years, um, and it was all based off of, that, off of that plant, the um, the bear's breach. I don't know it. I forgot why they called it bear's breaches. I I think I looked that up once, and I I just can't remember. It looks like little ants. But you can easily look it up. Google usually knows. Um, so here it is again. Sorry, this picture is not the greatest. It's a little blurry, or it got blown up and it's blurry. Um, but this is kind of how it grows. And believe it or not, this plant, uh, even though it's from the Mediterranean, uh, th this is kind of an old fashioned plant that they used to plant in Tucson. Um, I haven't seen it in the trade for a while. When I first moved here in the nineties, it would be in the shade section of uh, old fashioned nurseries. And uh, you know, my first job in Tucson was at Mesquite Valley and uh, Mesquite Valley growers. And we sold this plant. Um, it goes semi dormant or fully dormant in the summertime. It doesn't like our summer, but it's not that it doesn't like our summer. It's a Mediterranean plant, which um, gets all its rain in the winter time. It's a winter active growing plant. So in the summer, the leaves kind of turn yellow and they, they, um, they don't look that great. Um, and then they grow actively in the winter time, but you have to grow them in kind of protected areas. They're not terribly, uh, they, you know, they'll get damaged by the cold. 
and I think they spring is when they flower. But anyway, uh, this, that's just you know. Here's some other here's some other famous uh, acanths. This one kind of blows my mind that it's an acanth, but uh, Avicennia, which is mangrove. If you've ever been down to Sonora on the coast and you got down to the mangrove, which is uh, kind of south of Hermosillo on the coast, you'll start to see mangroves and they're in Baja, California too. And they're, of course, they're all over the world. Um, and uh, if you've been to Florida, they're there. Um, they're, they're all throughout the tropics. Uh, mangrove is, a, is an acanth. Um, and then these plants are more famous plants uh, in the national scene in, in the United States or in actually around the world. That first one, lollipop plant, they call it. Um, some people still call that, they call it yellow shrimp plant. And then the one on the right is actually a plant that we can grow in our landscapes here. And uh, it's from Mexico. So it's not that, it's native not that far from here. And that's shrimp plant. We sometimes sell that one. We don't sell the lollipop plant because that's more of a tropical house plant or a tropical plant. But the shrimp plant actually does well in, in, in Tucson. And we'll get into that. <clears throat> but uh, the acanthaceae, um, is a, is now I'm not going to, if you want to really study, let me do this really quick. I'm going to stop share for a second. Oops. Um, okay. And then, uh, sorry, I'm just doing a thing really quick. I want you to show you some books. If you really want to dig deeper into learning your plant families and stuff, um, probably one of the best books to start off with is this one. Um, I hope this shows up. Uh, I think it, it does. Will. Yeah. So uh, Botany in a Day is great. And it goes through all these uh, plant families and, and it gives you some patterns to look for so you can identify plants in each family um, no matter where you live. And so um, this is a really great book and I highly recommend this book. And then if you want to dig deeper, there's two books. Um, this book is a little outdated because some names have changed, but it's still very uh it'll give you a lot of this is a good book to get um and then finally this is a newer book but it's fantastic and that's plants of the world and it's a tomb okay it even has two it doesn't have not one uh page saver it has two uh two of them there's the yellow and a green one there it's huge but anyway this book is great and it's and is fairly updated and that that family of the pic, the picture of the family tree it came from this book and and it goes into like um you know the, the whole the genetic evidence and stuff like that i mean it doesn't dig deep into it but it just gives you an idea so a lot of those change all the new changes are in here um so this is this is fantastic so if you want to learn that stuff that's where you can really dig in we will go into some of that um here but i just want you to know that like don't feel stressed about it and think that you have to learn everything right now uh because you don't <clears throat> okay but in general the acanthaceae um, they usually have simple leaves what does that mean simple leaves means they're not divided a mesquite leaf is divided right so it's like little tiny leaves that are part of one big leaf right um sometimes uh, leaves that are not simple are only broken up in two or three, right? But uh, simple leaves are entire. There's like one thing that's the leaf. And, uh, and also the leaves are opposite. That means like this, right? Not alternate where the leaf is, one leaf is here and another leaf is here, but opposite, which means the leaves emerge from the same node, two leaves um, are, are emerging from the same node, okay? So that's one trait. That doesn't mean that all plants in the acanthaceae are like that. It's just one of the traits. And that's how you get to learn the families, right? You're gonna learn that there's certain traits that a lot of the families have, but when you put them all together, it's like, oh, that's an acanth. And you might not learn this by heart. And to be honest, I don't either. I've been doing this for a long time and I, I learned all this stuff a long time ago and then I forgot it because you know what? You start to just recognize them. Just like um, when you get into plants, you start to recognize plants and you don't know why that plant is that plant. You just, you've been doing it for such a long time. You're like, oh yeah, that's uh, you know this plant or whatever. Um, it, it same goes for families. Once you start getting the idea of what a certain plant family looks like, you just start to recognize them. And most of you, that's what you're gonna do and that's okay. Um, <clears throat> anyway, on, moving on, the flowers are usually on a spike. Not all flowers are on spikes. 
Um, and, um, and they often have bracts. And sometimes the bracts are mistaken for the flowers. Bougainvilleas, which are not in this family, also have bracts. Um, Bougainvillea is the, the part that we usually call the flower, like the Barbacaris bougainvillea, which is big pink gaudy looking thing, has a little white flower in the middle. The white flower in the middle is the actual flower and the thing around the, the outside is the bract. So in the, if you can look down there, you can see um, the letter F and G there is the shrimp plant. And uh, you can see that they're pointing to the bracts there. Those are not the flowers, that's the bract, but that flower is a little white thing with the, with the tongue sticking out with the purple on, on the purple dots on the, on the tongue. So anyway, uh, a lot of the acants have bracts, not all of them, or, or not all of them have bracts that are showy like that, but that is a trait that often shows up. Um, the flowers typically have uh, four to five petals, rarely three. Um, sometimes, and they're always irregular, although they're not always clear. So if you look down there on, on K, uh, I think that's Thunbergia. It almost looks like a regular flower. What does that mean, a regular and irregular flower? Um, irregular flowers are not symmetrical. They're, they're um, zygomorphic. And so they, they have these um, uneven petal numbers and there's usually some a lower part that's a little different than the upper part. And so acants uh, have those, um, those irregular flowers. They're, they're not quite symmetrical. Um, some of them are tricky because they almost look like they are, but if you look really closely at them, they're not really symmetrical. And there's usually two to four stamens to each petal and, the, and they are attached to the petal. Um, they have superior ovaries and then they have these uh, carpels, which is, is uh, what turns into the seed. And the seed usually has, uh, I believe two, I mean the, the, the fruit, I'm sorry. And the fruit usually has two seeds in it. And they spit seeds at you. Almost all the acans do this. When, when, the, when the fruit dries, which when I say fruit, it's not a fleshy fruit that we think of as fruits that you eat. It's a dry capsule. And then when that capsule, it'll dry out. And then when it gets wet, usually from rain, um, the capsule explosively spits out its seeds. Um, Ruelia, which is in this family, um, is one that people can associate with this because they're watering their Ruelias and then the, the, the little seeds get spit at you and sometimes they hit you on the cheek or something. So, um, so anyways, a lot of families do that. Are orchids irregular? Yes, orchids are irregular and truly zygomorphic. Um, yeah, there's a lot of plants that have irregular flowers. So it's all these traits together that will learn, teach you what an acanth is. Don't worry if you don't remember all these things. And there's, there's even more to it than that. Those are the basic things. If you really wanna learn those things, you just start studying, start on this book and focus on the, the plant families that you have available to you in your area, whether it's your garden or where you live, the wild plants where you live is where I would suggest. I and mean, you can really learn the plant families. So, uh, so that's the acanth AC. And, don't worry about all those traits. Like I said, it's like this, the goal of this class isn't to get you to memorize all that stuff. I just want you to be aware of them. And, um, and that these, that really what I wanted to do is profile a bunch of plants and put them together in a family. So you're not just learning plants randomly, you're learning them together as a family you know, and it helps you store them in your head. Like, oh yeah, these are related. Justicia, oh, I'm gonna take another sip here first. Cheers, everybody. Uh -huh. Um, so let's start off with the first genus. This is not the species, this is a whole group of plants. So subfamily, below the family level, we have genera, it's plural for genus, justicia. And you, you, some of you and many of you, maybe all of you know um, this, this uh, group of plants. <clears throat> the picture on there is the Mexican honeysuckle. A lot of them are called honeysuckle. That's an unfortunate name because uh, there's a lot of things called honeysuckle. And that's a problem with common names, right? Um, they don't really tell you much about plants because people call things, anything that has a tubular flower is like, oh, that's a honeysuckle. And like, there's so many plants called honeysuckles and none of them, a lot of them aren't even related at all. Um, these are generally the desert honeysuckles. There's about 700 species of justicia. Um, they tend to be native to tropical warm temperate areas. 
um, and uh, hummingbirds love them. And um, almost all of them are larval food plants for the tiny checker spot, the Texas crescent and the pearl crescent in our area. Okay, so let's go into them. Um, this is a favorite plant of a lot of people. It's definitely one of mine, the chuparosa, Justicia californica. So um, you usually find it in, in like sandy washes. Um, one of the, when's the last time we saw a chuparosa? Can you remember? We saw a really nice one in organ pipe. Yeah, that's the one I was thinking of. I was trying to think of if, if there was one that we've seen. I'm sure we have, but that one was just so good. Yeah, yeah. I should say California. <clears throat> Oh, I'm sorry for the, you know, I get spell checked a lot on, on, um, on the, the program I use for these slideshows and because it just doesn't understand botanical names. Justicia Californica, not California. Um, anyway, uh, I tried to catch all of those. Anyway, um, this is a cool plant. So yeah, the last time we saw one was in Oregon Pipe National Monument at the base of the Ajo Mountains in a sandy wash. And it was um, huge. Six feet tall. Six feet, yeah. And like, what, eight feet wide? Yeah. It was huge. It was an old one. And, um, and hummingbirds all over it, they were just all battling each other, just like, shoo, shoo. like it, it, and it's always like that. Chuparosa in the wild has always got hummingbirds on it. And in fact, this species um, of Justicia of all the justicias, this one determines the path, the migrational paths of hummingbirds more than, than probably any other justicia. Um, and in fact, maybe more than a lot of other plants. I'd have to really sit and think about other hummingbird plants and if there was, at least in the lowlands, in the, in the desert, chuparosa is probably the most important plant to hummingbirds. Maybe aside from epilobium, um, formerly known as Zoshneria, Epilobium canum, um, the hummingbird plant, which is a stupid name. Um, desert fuchsia. We like the name desert fuchsia, yeah. Uh, but anyway, that plant's pretty important too. Um, these plants will bloom even on the toughest of years like this year. Um, Chuparosa is cool because it can just drop its leaves and, um, and look like a succulent um, and when it's on, when it's in cultivation, it usually retains its leaves if it's on irrigation. Um, but even sometimes in a really hot, hot summer, it'll drop its leaves and it'll be mostly green stems. Um, and it looks almost succulent, like the stems are green and they can photosynthesize through the stem, which is not something that all um, flowering plants can do. Most flowering plants, you know, photosynthesize through their leaves. And they're all like, I'm a stem, I can't be photosynthetic and the leaf has got to be the photosynthetic thing. And so Chuparosa is like, hey man, we can photosynthesize in the stem. Who cares about the rules? Um, so, you know, Chuparosa is cool. Um, it definitely has one of those spinning seeds. Question? Can it grow at 4,200 feet? Depends on where at 4,200 feet, but there, let's put it this way, because uh, 4,200 feet does not always mean the same in terms of your cold temperatures, but let's just say this, it's hardy to 20 degrees. So if it gets below 20 degrees, it's going to get damaged. Um, you can cover it and, uh, and prevent it from freezing back too hard. Um, put it somewhere south facing. Put it on a south facing wall, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, it's, it can take full, full sun. You can take reflected heat. This plant's really tough. Um, one of the ones I always see is at one of our, uh, we bank at Tucson Federal Credit Union and in front of one of them that we go to, it's, uh, it's on a south facing wall and they even hedge it all the time. Oh my God, I hate that so much. But they shear it with the, the shears to make a perfect little ball. And even that plant still looks good, especially when it blooms. It's just like a little fireball. Um, even though it looks stupid, um, <laughs> but, uh, best to give this plant room, let it sprawl around. It tends to, uh, billow kind of like plumbago billows or not quite as much as a bougainvillea, but it does have long arching stems that come down and uh, arch and it starts billowing on top of itself and so it makes a nice big shrub. Um, so give it room and, uh, definitely full sun. You know, once it's established, you know, moderate water, the more you water it and care for it, of course, the better it'll do. Do, do remember that it is not native to, you know, dry 
foothills, it's more native to sandy washes. So it likes riparian areas, but dry riparian areas, you know, the Ajo Mountains is not exactly the wettest place in the world and they're doing great in there. So, um, you know, we say, we, we say they're about, about to five feet tall, but remember that it can get bigger than that. So that's the chuparosa. It's a, one of our favorite plants. Um, Justicia candicans. This is a really cool plant. It's also native to washes. It's not quite as arid growing as the chuparosa, but it, and, and you know, another name for this group of justicia is they call them water willows sometimes because they, they do grow in riparian areas where they need a little bit more shade. Um, you know, they usually have a little bit more of a, of a break from the sun. This can grow in full sun, but it's probably best with a, a little afternoon break. Um, they're semi deciduous. They'll drop some of their leaves in the winter and on a really cold snap that can kind of knock off the leaves. But the cool thing about this plant is that it blooms when nothing else is blooming. And, it, and if it's, if it hasn't been frozen, um, the flowers will show up right now in the winter time when like very little else is blooming. So that's the important thing about justicia candicans. They call it desert justicia. Um, I've heard a couple other names, but um, it's um, you know, about a three foot plant. So not as big as the chuparosa and it's, it's, it doesn't have those photosynthetic stems, um, but it does tend to retain its leaves again, unless the, the, you know, the cold knocks it off and it's hardy to about the mid twenties. When I say that the mid twenties will knock the stems back, it'll still come back but about the mid twenties uh, is what will start to damage the leaves and the stems, the outer stems. Cool plant, beautiful flower. Um, and, uh, but the, the important thing about this plant is that it, it fills in a lot of those slots where nothing else is blooming. This plant here, um, it was once called Siphonoglossa. Um, who knows how to pronounce that? But anyway, uh, it's now a justicia. So here's a name change, right? Um, this plant you find, uh, you can go out to the Tucson mountains here and you see them um, often nibbled back, especially this year by, uh, by herbivores because uh, there's nothing else to eat really, but um, they get nibbled back a lot. And it's often kind of, uh, it, it can be difficult to tell this apart from another plant that we'll go over, but <clears throat> but this plant uh, is really cool. It's got these really long white flowers. Um, and this is one of those uh, sort of more night blooming plants. Um, look at the flower, it's white and it's got a really long tube. So what do you think, what do you think pollinizes that? Um, something with a long proboscis and flying around at night, a, a moth, it's probably a moth pollinated. Um, and, um, and uh, so this is a more of a diminutive sub shrub, uh, meaning it's a smaller growing plant. In our landscapes, it's going to get bigger than it does in nature because we're usually going to try to prevent it from being eaten. Um, it gets eaten back by rabbits and I don't know what else eats it, but something I always see it hiking. I always see it nibbled back um, <clears throat> unless you, it, you know, it's always growing in like rocky foothills and like granite, um, you know, that kind of like if you go out to uh picture, not picture X, what's a, a, the, um, Gates Pass. Yeah, Gates Pass. You go, those trails that are around Gates Pass, you'll see this growing there, and the, you'll see some that are growing, like, in a kind of harder to reach area where, like, the little herbivores can't get to it, and you'll see it a little bit bigger. Um, it's a cool plant. Um, not common in the trade. We've had it here and there. We, we try to grow it all the time because we like it, but, uh, it doesn't, uh, you know, it, it's, a uh, it doesn't look great in a container. Once you get in the ground, it's fine. Um, but it's, uh, it's just kind of a, a cute little diminutive native. So this isn't like a big landscape plant, but, um, but some of you nerds I know will like this plant. And I know I do. It's one of my, uh, it's, it's one of my favorite justicias. Um, <laughs> you said that about Chuparosa. I know. Well, Chuparosa is my favorite. Um, justicia sonori. So, oh, look, it, it misspelled it again, Sonora. Uh, that Sonora should have an E at the end, Sonore. Uh, Justicia Sonore. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so this is a purple flowering plant and um, it's uh, very common in Sonora. It does show up a little bit in, in, in the very, in the borderlands. Um, 
and it's almost weedy uh, in that it reseeds a lot and it'll, it'll pop up here and there. And it'll start off kind of as a, a smaller plant, but it can get to be about a, a thicker, you know, um, two, even a little bit taller sometimes, um, feet tall and spreading, especially in areas that don't get too cold. Um, but long, look at those beautiful flowers. I love that little landing strip in the tongue. Um, <clears throat> another one of those that spit the seeds out at you. In fact, everything we've shown so far does that. They all, they all spit their seeds at you. Most of these acants that we're showing you are like that. They, they spit their seeds at you. Um, and this one's hardy to at least 20 degrees. So, uh, it, you know, pretty good for most of Tucson. Um, and full sun to shade. Um, the plant I always think about, this is very common at the Desert Museum. Um, there's a bunch of these growing there, and uh, there's, there's one plant that's pretty magnificent there. It's about <clears throat> three feet wide and about two feet tall, um, and it, it, it'll get covered in purple flowers, and it's, it's in a semi, fairly shady spot, actually. Um, it's almost never in the trade, and it's not because it's hard to grow. It's actually kind of weedy, but, uh, but sometimes, you, you know, we're, like, I don't know, we, we haven't got the timing right when we're growing this. We always plant it at the wrong time of year, and then it goes you know, it slows down for the winter. So I got to, I got to plant it this spring, make sure we have enough of these this year, but it's a cool plant. So Justicia sonori, you can call it purple Justicia or Sonoran Justicia. And then I threw these two in here because they're, you, you know them probably. Um, they're more Mexico and we do sell them because we, uh, we like to stretch our native, um, you know, or a local plant, uh, regional oh, area <laughs> into Mexico because you feel like we're, a big part of Mexico. Um, the, the one there on the left there is the Mexican honeysuckle and it's a very famous plant in Tucson and it can grow in full sun to full shade and it surprisingly blooms um, pretty well in the shade. And, and I, I actually kind of suggest to give it some shade. Um, they tend to look a little lusher in the shade and not so beat up. In the full sun they can get kind of beat up looking especially in summertime. They'll survive it and they'll keep growing, but, uh, but a little shade make, goes a long way with this guy. And then, of course, we've already talked about the shrimp plant there, but uh, that is uh, from Mexico and south down into, I think, Central America. But um, um, easy plant to grow, a little bit frost tender. So, oh, you know, it's funny. Uh, there's, a, there's a huge hedge of shrimp plant. Um, uh, on the way down to Five Point, you know, the Five Points, if you're going to South Tucson, on what's that road to South Tucson? Either Stone or Six. Stone. Yeah, on Stone. You go down Stone and there's the cop shop there, uh, the police station. Um, I, Jared. Um, but there's a shrub of shrimp plant all there, uh, a big long shrub of it. And uh, um, there's, yeah, there's, a, if you want to see a big shrub of shrimp plant, there it is. Okay, we're into the next genus. This is Anisocanthus, and there's more of them than you think. Um, pictured there in picture is Anisocanthus ridei, um, or Quadrophytus ridei, um, and that's probably one of the most famous ones, but, uh, um, there's several of them. There's 17 accepted species, um, and um, it's a, obviously a very good hummingbird plant. Um, it's a larval food plant for the common buckeye, the tropical buckeye, the Cuban crescent spot, the banded peacock, the malachite, and the white peacock. So a lot of butterflies use this as a larval food plant, but it's also really good. Um, the whole genus is really good for hummingbirds. So, um, so all the ones that we're gonna go over, they're all good for all those guys. <clears throat> okay, so this is the one we were just talking about, An Anisocanthus quadrophytus, and it's technically variety ridei. There's another variety too, which I literally have never really ever seen, um, but I assume it's more west of here, like California. I don't know. I'd have to look that up, but uh, this is a very common plant in the trade. It's semi-deciduous, um, so it'll drop most of its leaves, sometimes all of its leaves if it gets really cold or the leaves kind of turn purple. This one reseeds like crazy. It's a really great plant for that. You, and it, sent, it tends to like, it pops up in places where you're like, yeah, okay, keep that plant there. That's nice. Um, so we've had, a, we've had a volunteer many times 
um, in our landscape at home, um, but also at the nursery, it pops up in the nursery and we don't have the heart to dig them out sometimes. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, it, it recedes readily. Um, it's a sort of a smaller shrub, you know, two or three feet tall and about as wide. Um, and like I said, it goes semi-dormant um, in, a, in a warm spot. It may not drop its leaves at all, but it will turn kind of purplish. And, uh, and it blooms almost all the time, um, except in the winter. So a uh, really long blooming season, um, very hardy down to zero degrees. Um, and, uh, um, you know, a pretty easy plant to grow. So, um, so that's the, that's that one. Oh yeah. Uh, they call it hummingbird plant or something. I don't know. <laughs> or honeysuckle. They call it, oh yeah, they call it, oh no, flame, they call it flame honeysuckle. I didn't write the common name down there. <laughs> uh, flame honeysuckle, but it didn't. It didn't uh, spell check quadrifidus. True. Notice that. Yeah. I don't know what it what it spell checked. <laughs> I guess the other ones, the other names, are too close to other things like Sonori, Sonora, or Mexicana, or whatever. Californica. Um, this one is the one that's native in the Tucson basin, and I love this plant. Um, desert honeysuckle, um, and this acanthus thurberi. It has like a brick red orangey flower. Um, it's it's mostly evergreen. Um, in cool in colder spots, it may drop some of its leaves. It is best with some afternoon shade. I've seen this plant grow in full sun and do wonderful, but with some work on the soil and good watering and stuff like that. And, and in, in nature, I see it in full sun, um, but it's in a really nice protected area where there's lots of rocks over the root ball and and uh and it's doing fine but a lot of people have tried to grow this in full sun and they don't give it the love that they should and it, and it struggles so uh, if you if you're not going to baby it um, give it a little afternoon shade um it's a more of an upright plant than the other one is so flame acanthus is like a two or three foot tall plant usually and um and this plant's more upright and it can get as tall as six feet or more Sometimes you get these weirdos, like if you go to Sycamore Canyon, there's like this one individual that we remember all the time that has yellow flowers. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so every once in a while you'll find a yellow, and we've actually sold some plants that um, Katie's dad grew that were yellow selections of, uh, of the species. But they're mostly, they're mostly like a bricky, bricky orange, not quite red, um, bricky orange color. And uh, it's hardy about, it's 10 degrees, you know, so really hardy. Um, the, that kind of cold might knock off the leaves a little bit, but uh, it takes it just fine. And uh, very, this actually, you know, I was talking about chuparosa being super important to hummingbirds. This is another one. And, and I didn't think about this one when I was talking about chuparosa, but this one's probably equally important and it's more common. Um, you see this everywhere. Um, and when you start tooling around southeastern Arizona, you find it in the washes and you find it, um, you know, growing mostly in canyons and washes and stuff like that. I, I also, you know, it's, it's out in Tucson Mountains and it's growing in, in the, on the roadsides there. So a super cool plant. It's, this is actually one of my favorite plants. <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. <clears throat> okay, here's a cool one that uh, we'll, we'll, we're trying to get going and we'll have, I have seed of it and I just got to get around the plant in it. Um, but uh, it's a pink flowered honeysuckle, pinky honeysuckle. I like that name. Um, it is sporadically available in Tucson. Uh, and I say that, I, I only say that because I know that Desert Survivors has probably sold this in the past. It's not particularly rare but uh but it's it's not common it's hard to get a hold of um and it only shows up once in a while we're gonna we're gonna try to make this guy available very hardy down to at least you know uh the books say 15 degrees and i think it goes colder than that because it's grown at your dad's house that giant giant one that's behind the nursery there <clears throat> like uh kind of near the the pines mm -hmm. um and he gets so cold over there so um, at least 15 degrees, and I think it actually goes much lower than that. And this one recedes a lot too. So um, um, the flowers are kind of a little bit more bigger and spidery um, and they're pink. 
so again, hummingbirds love this plant. Um, you know, another thing, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure I've seen finches um, on Anisocanthus probably trying to grab those seeds before they get spat out of the carpels. <laughs> um, maybe, it's, maybe that's their version of rock candy. They like nibble on the carpels and it pops into their mouth. Huh. I don't know, I'm just making stuff up. <laughs> Um, this one is very rarely, if ever, shown up in the trade in Tucson, but it's cool. It's something that is available in Texas, and that's why it gets over here sometimes. Um, and this Acanthus andersoni. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is Andersonia, not Linearis. We'll get into Linearis. This one we've sold. Um, this one's from Sonora, and um, it's native to canyons. Um, it's really gorgeous. Um, I should have, I, I, I've lost the picture that I have of it with the leaves kind of purple. Um, the, leaves, right? Yeah, the leaves are bigger than, so think of this as sort of like, well, the flowers are big. They're like uh, a couple of, uh, two or three inches long and very spidery and uh, even more spidery than the pink um, honeysuckle. And uh, they, um, um, they have these leaves that are in, bigger than any of the other in this acanthus, pretty big, and they turn purple with the cold. They can get knocked off by air cold because they are, um, <clears throat> they're really tropical plants, but they can, they can take cold down to at least 20 degrees and, uh, and they become, they're pretty big shrubs. They can, they can uh, get about eight feet or more tall. Um, I've always seen these in Sonora and all the, you know, the Palm Canyons and stuff like that. Um, and uh, just magnificent when they're blooming. We, the, the flower colors range from r deep red to orange. I think the ones that we have right now are more on the orange side, um, but just big and spidery and beautiful. Um, we don't have any for sale right now. We sold all the ones that we had, I think. Did we sell them all or is there one left? And sold, but we have some to take cuttings from and make more available. Very, very cool plant. Um, should be should be more available. <clears throat> okay, this is the one that's from Texas, and this Acanthus linearis, and not just Texas, but like south into to, into Mexico. And uh, it's a lot like all the ones we've been talking about. It's deciduous um, and and very hardy, very cold hardy. Um, you can think of this as a little bit like the one we were just talking about. The flowers are not quite as long and the very linear leaves. Um, the leaves are, you know, thin. <clears throat> this is <clears throat> this is actually a lot like flame acanthus um, in terms of size and deciduousness. Um, this is a little bit more deciduous, at least in Texas, where it gets a little bit colder. Um, and uh, but it flowers a lot. Um, this one, this is the one that I've almost never seen here. I mean, I've just only seen plant nerds have them who brought them from Texas, but, uh, but we'll try to make this one available. We just need to get a hold of some seed or a plant where you can take cuttings from. So let's all take a sip. All right, let's move on to Ruelia. So this is an acanth. Um, the flowers don't look that irregular at first glance, but there's um, an odd number. Of, there's five petals and they're kind of fused. And if you look at them, they're not symmetrical, <clears throat> but this is an acanth. And there's 160 species of Ruelia. Um, Mexico is really where they're really big. Um, and, um, but they're, they are all around the world. They're in Africa. Um, there's, there's, you know, like I said, 160 species. Um, they attract a lot of pollinators, um, not just the hummingbirds, but the hummingbirds do like these flowers, but the, you know, bees really like them too. Um, this is a larval food for the common buckeye, the tropical buckeye, Cuban crescent, banded peacock, malachite, and white peacock. So pretty much the same as the um, anisocanthus. Um, so let's start with this one. Now, um, in the trade, you won't see this called Ruelia simplex. They call it Ruelia bretonia. Um, but uh, the name on this one changed a long time ago. This is the nursery trade never caught up. Um, we've sold it as Ruelia Bretonia at times just be, to make it familiar to people so they knew what they're getting a hold of, but, but it's Ruelia simplex. That's, a, that's the right name for this plant. Mexican wild petunia. <clears throat> this can be a real weedy plant. This is a Mexican species. 
Um, it's a little bit more tropical, but it grows really well here. It does really want a good amount of water. And um, there are some, there's some selections of this, some dwarf selections. There's a pink flowered one, there's a white flowered one. Um, and this plant's okay. It's kind of weedy and requires a lot of water. Um, we've sold it in the past, um, but uh, we like some of the more native ones. Um, and, uh, you know, native meaning like actual Arizona natives like this one. Um, this is uh, Ruelia nudiflora and, uh, or the Arizona wild petunia. Now, petunias, the, the, the um, annual uh, flower that people plant are not related to this at all. They just call them that because they resemble a petunia. Uh, petunias are actually in the Solanaceae, I think, um, in the nightshade family. So um, I don't think they're related at all. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's a, I think it's Solanaceae. Um, nightshade but this is they just call it petunia because it kind of looks like them um <clears throat> but this is the one that's actually native to arizona it's uh it's a softer like uh, lighter green leaf this one recedes really well um we have it coming up all over our nursery if you bought a plant from us that wasn't a ruelia you might have gotten a ruelia because <laughs> they because <laughs> they volunteer and 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 most people don't mind them. So, um, you know, and they are great plants. They're great pollinator plants. They're great larval food plants. So um, why not let it, let it, you know, spit its seed around and get all seedy and stuff. Um, this plant is uh, winter dormant, mostly. Um, it can, uh, it can stay evergreen in a little protected spot. Sometimes a little seedling will stay green. Um, but if it goes dormant and dies to the ground, don't, freak out it'll come back in the it has tuberous roots and it'll come back from its roots in in the spring so um so uh, just think of it as a deciduous plant and be happy if it's not ruelia peninsularis is the other ruelia that uh, you might sometimes see in the trade and we do like this plant a lot this is a more shrubby plant um and you've probably seen these around in um parking lots and and uh, it, it, because of uh, Mountain States Nursery, which is a big wholesaler, uh, they made them widely available in landscape uh, to uh, to big landscapers, and so they're in highway medians and stuff. Um, they have sort of a silvery colored branch, and uh, and then the little little green leaves, um, and uh, most of the year they're blooming. Um, they'll take a break in the winter time, but. Um, usually about a four or five foot tall shrub. Um, unfortunately, because they're often in commercial landscapes, they make little balls out of them. And uh, so you see that a lot. Um, they call this Baja Ruelia because it's from Baja, California. Um, it's hardy to about 20 degrees and it's fairly uh, drought tolerant. Um, nice plant. It's a really good plant. Still hummingbirds and all the other things that all are well is. It can totally grow in shade. Uh, this plant actually can grow in full shade and still look decent. So that's kind of nice. And that's true about all the Ruelias actually. Um, Ruelias will bloom in the shade and they will, they will look decent in the shade. So that's a really nice um, attribute um, because if anyone who has a lot of shade, if you have some big mesquites in your yard, um, you start to realize that shade is not the greatest thing if you're trying to grow a lot of plants because a lot of plants really want sun. Um, but uh, um, there are some plants that will actually bloom and look good in the shade, and this is one of them. And we've had people ask um, when we mean weedy. Oh, yeah, let's talk about that. So, uh, so okay, let's back up a little bit. I was talking about this plant being on the weedy side. Um, so when I say weedy, this isn't an escapee. Um, it's not going to outcompete natives and cause trouble like um, plants from, um, there, there's some plants from, uh, grasses are notorious plants is that, that if they're, you know, from, especially from their, they're from farther away than just our regional area, right? This is almost native here. Um, it's, it starts to show up in Sonora, I believe. So, um, so it's not that far away from here, but when you have a plant that grew up in a completely different place with completely different environment, 
um, and then it's planted here. Sometimes it has no natural enemies and it just um, takes up places that other native plants can't grow. Um, so buffalo grass is a good example. It's, a, it's from Africa, it's a grass, and, um, and it's also a fire climax community plant. It comes from a place where fire is an important part of their ecology. The low desert is not a fire climax community. So um, that's a true weed. It's a, it's a plant that change, alters the environment. It, it takes up places where natives can grow. Um, so that's a different kind of weedy than when we say, oh, little plant's a little weedy. Sometimes plants are just, uh, they volunteer a lot. And in the landscape, that can be annoying to some people or a uh, or blessing to some people. If you're trying to fill up some space and it has a pretty flower, why not? That's great. You can always pull it. Um, but uh, and another plant we call weedy, but it's not a weed, is the native desert broom. And I'm sure most of you who are watching this know uh, we're big fans of the desert broom. It's a native plant. Um, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. There's a lot of old codgers in Tucson like, that's not native. And burr, 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 burr. Uh, it's native. It's more native than any of us are. Um, it's a pioneer plant, which means that it takes over. Um, it, 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 it um, pioneers areas of disturbed soil. So those kind of plants can be kind of weedy. Now, Bacchus um, desert broom would be a terrible weed if we brought it to Africa and uh, introduced it there or Australia, you know, somewhere where they doesn't have uh, competitors. Um, it would probably be a terrible weed. And, and buffalo grass where it's native is that, it's a pioneer plant and it has its role where it lives, but we put it over here and it becomes a problem. So there's the difference. Um, some of our native plants are very seedy and they come up a lot. So they're, you know, weedy, but they're not, true weeds. Um, and so true weeds is invasive. An invasive species is something that um, that alters the environment. It's not from here. It often um, invasive species also, this is an important part. Who cares if a new species comes in and takes over, right? Um, but the important part is that that plant didn't evolve here. And what does that mean? It means that all these other animals and insects and stuff that depend on all our native plants don't, they can't get much from that plant, right? So um, it creates a desert. It creates a, a um, ecological desert where not a lot's happening. And there are, there are some species that are native here of insects or birds or whatever that can make some use of these weedy plants. But, um, but uh, by far, like our rule at our nursery is like, um, you know, we try to grow plants that are native here and that aren't invasive species. Um, but the question we always ask is, um, is that plant offering a, enough for our wild migratory birds and insects and stuff? That's really important. And so that's um, a plant like Ruelia is, you know, it's a larval food plant for several butterflies. It's a hummingbird plant. It's, it's very useful. So this is different than buffalo grass, which is hardly useful to anything. It's, Buffalo grass is just a, a fairly useful, a fairly useless plant unless you're a cow, and it's not even a great cow grass. Anyway, I, I'm probably beating the subject to the <laughs> flogging a dead horse. Um, you get it. All right, let's talk about some other acans, and these are kind of like one-offs or two-offs, right? We got a few species that um, that the genera. There's not a lot of them here, but we have some cool ones. So let's talk about them. And most of these plants you're going to find in like very rocky, like uh, soils, like canyon walls and stuff like that. Um, so let's start with this. Uh, this is Caloridia. This is um, before it's blooming. You might mistake this for that Justicia longii that we looked at earlier. Um, and they look kind of similar, but when they're blooming, you can definitely tell the difference. This has that winged flower and um, it's a cool little plant. There's, there's actually three species that show up in Arizona of Carloridia. Uh, oh, look, it didn't, it didn't spell check me there with Arizonica. <sighs> anyway, uh, there's also uh, Carloridia texana, which almost looks identical. Um, I actually can't tell you offhand without looking um, on, on a, on a um, 
on a flora or something like what's the differences. But uh, I can tell you that the Texas species is native to the eastern side of Arizona, like because it's from Texas. And so it kind of barely gets into Arizona and it's in New Mexico. Um, and this one's more, you know, most of Arizona and then very strongly more west. Um, <clears throat> but um, it's in this, this species is in the Tucson mountains. And um, it has that same kind of, uh, very few leaves it can photosynthesize you can see in the picture there it can photosynthesize through that stem it's green which is uh, pretty cool um it has one of those uh capsules that spit the seeds out um which is really frustrating if you're trying to collect some seeds to plant this thing um it's uh, definitely uh definitely going to be moth pollinated um I, I wrote probably but it's definitely um moth pollinated hardy about 20 degrees the Texas species is a little bit hardier. That's one difference. Um, and then there's Coloridia um, linear folia, which has a purple flower. And uh, it's a bit of a bigger, shrubbier plant. Um, and I didn't put a picture in here, sorry. But th those other species are almost never available. I've never seen Coloridia linear folia available. Um, maybe we can change that at some point. Um, but there's Coloridia, um, cool little plant. Arizona rightwort is the common name that most people use. Um, so this, this plant is the same as this one. So there it is blue and here it is almost purple. This plant is really cool and we've seen it a lot um, when we go out. Uh, we saw this a lot in the Patagonia mountains. Remember that growing kind of on the uh, kind of hillsides. Um, sometimes it doesn't have any leaves at all. So see those scaled scaled uh, flower spikes that are popping up there. Sometimes that's the only thing that's showing. And then it pops out those flowers, which are, um, they're, they're more open at night, um, but this is often found in the kind of shady canyons and stuff like that. So sometimes the flowers will be open during the day too. Um, but it, I've seen it grown in full sun. I've seen it grown in the shade. Um, and it always looks different. Like when it's in shade, the leaves are out more. <coughs> And, but if it's in full sun, it'll be just those, often just those flower spikes. We've sold it, we sold a few of these um, and we kept most of them. <laughs> I mean, um, cause yeah, yeah, we kept, well, we only had like a few of them. Um, Tohono Chul grew a bunch of these that, oh yeah, the, I like the common name of this, the Atascosa rock pixie. Uh, Atascosa after the mountains, cause it's in the Atascosas um and rock pixie because it's a little pixie and it grows in the rocks um <laughs> there's a very wide range uh you know um up to about five thousand or more feet actually i think i've seen it a little higher like six thousand feet but um but protected canyons um and it, as far as cold hardiness we don't really know because no one's really tested it out because this hasn't hardly ever been in cultivation it's a cool plant I mean, look at that flower it, and it shows up in the morning. You walk out in the morning and the flowers are just like, oh, they're just, they're gorgeous. Um, by the afternoon, they're gone, but uh, who cares? Like be a morning person or be a night person because they show up at night too. They start to open up at dusk. So um, cool little plant. Okay, so that's the, that's the, uh, oh, a Littraria uh, imbricata. Um, who cares how you pronounce it, but there it is. Um, the Atascosa rock pixie. Um, here's another one, Tetranurum nervosum. Um, a little bit like the rock pixie, but uh, sometimes this even looks like an annual. Uh, this is a very kind of woody looking one, but most of the time I see them, they're very green. Um, <clears throat> they don't have any woodiness to them at all, um, but it is a perennial. And uh, um, kind of that same bract kind of spike, uh, but the flower is a little bit more yellow with that purple mark on the, on the, I think it's more the top. <clears throat> um, but uh, um, you see this in kind of the same zones as you see the rock, the Atascosa rock um, pixie. Is that what we called it? Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. I can't remember who came up with that name, but I like it. Uh, this is called Harry Fornwort, and that is an official name from SignNet. Um, so uh, uh, but this is a cool plant. It, it, there's a lot of crossover between this species and the, 
in the Latreria. Um, they're, they're, you find them in the same areas. So for example, if you wanna see both this plant and this plant uh, go down um, Ruby Road. So before you get to, if you go down I-19 and Nogales is a turn off of Ruby Road and that just go down that road and there's so many cool plants on that road, but uh, this is native there along with uh, that other plant. Um, here's another one that shows up all over the place. Um, this is pretty common. Uh, a lot on roadsides. We, we see this on roadsides all the time. I think the last time I remember seeing this, <coughs> um, we see it all the time. But just last time I'm thinking about that we saw it was, what's that canyon on the, on the north side of the um, Santa Rita's that we drive through to go to home? If you don't want to take- Florida? Florida Canyon in the Santa Rita's is the last time we saw this. Um, but we've seen it in, on Mount Lemmon. I mean, uh, on the roadsides, it's often on roadsides um, or in, um, under mesquite trees and stuff like that. Very, um, weedy. very weedy. Yeah. Very see, reseeds a lot that it spits its seeds out just like the, uh, the, a lot of these other acanths do. Um, Arizona foldwing, Dicliptera versupinata. Um, and uh, it's got these gorgeous little purple flowers. This plant needs to be cut back once in a while because um, it gets kind of like ratty looking. The, uh, the, the seed pod has these little sheaths around, uh, around the outside, which are bracts that, that dried up and they, they sort of cling on. So, um, so the, the plant can look unruly sometimes. I don't mind that personally, but some people like their plants a little bit more polished. So um, you can whack this plant back as much as you want. It'll come back um, at least two to three feet tall and wide, but it can get a little bit bigger. Um, it seems to look its best in part shade. It totally grows in full sun, but needs a little bit more love. Um, and uh, it can bloom almost any time of year if there's some warmth. So cool little plant. And that, that might be, oh, then there's another one. <clears throat> so this is uh, this is a plant we've we come across a lot in the grasslands. Um, the you know where I think about this plant all the time is when we go to the Canelo Hills at mm -hmm. um, what's the name of the place we stay at? The Birdhouse. The Birdhouse, which oh. is by the way, check it out on Airbnb. Airbnb in the Canelo Hills. Um, it's a great place to stay. That's where we stay. Um, if you want to go birding, Heartstone Ranch. Heartstone Ranch. Um, if you want to go birding, it's a great place to to be centered at because you can go down to the San Rafael Valley and go birding. You can go all throughout Patagonia, Sonoida, Elgin, and go birding, or you can go the other way and go into the Huachuca Mountains. It's really great. But this plant is all over the place <clears throat> um, in the grasslands there, and. Uh, Oh, thank you. I, we're, we're using the same cord for two computers. And so uh, one of the times when we were teaching a class, we actually weren't paying attention and the, the computer ran out of juice. Whoops. Um, so anyway, this is called spreading snake herb. And there's actually uh, quite a few species. I can't remember how many of um, Dischoristi, Dischoristi shittiana. <laughs> Uh, anyway, spreading snake herb. Um, and uh, I've, I saw this species once when I first moved here and I was working at Mesquite Valley Growers. We were actually selling, I don't know where the hell they came from, um, but someone sold Mesquite Valley these plants and they, they had a few of them. Um, so that was my first experience with this genus. Um, and uh, Anyway, uh, it's very, very hardy to the cold. Um, we have one plant here in a one gallon that I still haven't planted yet. Um, <clears throat> and it hasn't dropped leaves at all this winter. So at least in Tucson, it's evergreen. And it has those, they're, they're smaller than a Ruelia fl flower, but it's a lot like a Ruelia flower, but maybe a little bit more, like the petals are a little bit more distinct. And um, it's a cool little plant. Um, so very hardy, uh, fairly drought tolerant once it's established, really good combination with native grasses. Oh yeah, and I think this might be the last one. I like this plant a lot, Henria insularis. Um, 
we've got one. This is a tropical plant, or at least it's from Sonora mostly. It does burp up into Arizona here and there. And I think Sycamore Canyon is one of those places that it shows up in. But, you know, canyons right on the border, um, protected canyons, you'll find, you'll find this plant growing. I think it's um, <coughs> probably shows up in the Patagonia Mountains. Um, and it's got more of a yellow flower, um, but it has that same habit that a lot of these plants, this plant, um, this one, that one, and that one, they have this habit of like, um, having these weird growth patterns where they just forget about leaves. And it's, uh, and when you think about that evolutionarily, that's probably where Chuparosa was like too. And then Chuparosa began to develop more of a habit of just dropping leaves whenever it wanted to, but stay shrubby. These are more herbaceous plants, but you'll sometimes see them like where, where it's just all flower spike and there's no leaves. And, um, it, and, and then, and then it gets a lot of rain and then they'll get really leafy and they look like entirely different plants and either one looks cool, but they're just like totally different looking. Um, and so anyway, um, this plant is almost never in the trade. We got one from the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum sale. So if you want to get a lot of these weird plants, the ones that aren't common that we've talked about, of course, we try to make them available. Desert Survivors is a good place to go. Um, the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum sales, Tohono Chul, um, you know, all the botanical garden type sales are where you find these weirdos at. And, um, and of course, us and Desert Survivors. Those are the main places you find these weirdos. Um, so that's that on, on, uh, on the Acanthaceae. Um, I'm just going to do a little thing here where I, <clears throat> there we go. Um, so um, anyway, uh, I hope that was a nice little um, introduction to the family and I hope that uh, wasn't too rambly. Um, you know, we're open to criticism, so um, let us know. Um, we have a, a bunch of different classes coming up on various subjects. We do um, family posts like this two other times in this next series of classes. If you go to our website and click online classes, you'll see what we have coming up. Um, we have one on, um, oh, Carrie Ann Campbell. The next, the next one is enclosures to please your tortoise. Yeah, so that's next week. Um, we're gonna do tortoise plants and also just about general um, tortoise enclosures. Also uh, a lot of the acanths are tortoise plants. The acanths are great tortoise plants. Um, and the one after that is warm season vegetable garden. Okay. Um, but we've got uh, the Euphorbia AC. That was Euphorbia one. AC. So, so we're kind of trying to mix it up a little bit so that the classes also, also because they don't end up too long. Cause we had a couple classes that were such big subjects. We tried to <clears throat> squeeze them all into a small class and they ended up being three hours long or something. Like we're, we're going to try not to do that again. Um, so uh anyway um yeah and then the two other families i can think of that were covering um and the, the euphorbia as a family and the palm family um it's uh we want to we want people to like palms so um, that's like one of the last classes but uh and that's uh i think joe curry wanted that one of our regular followers um suggested that um and it, we've had other people ask too and i'm a huge fan of palms so anyway that's like down the line a little bit. Um, next week's going to be tortoises. I um, wanted to see if uh, anyone wanted, to, we're going to open this up to questions. You can ask questions about any of the plants that we've been talking about. You can ask questions about something that's com completely unrelated. Um, um, if you have a plant question, a problem with a plant, if you're going to ask that type of question, um, make sure it's something we can answer right now. Sometimes it's like, we need to see pictures and stuff, but, um, but if you have some general questions, um, let us know. Do you have any questions so far? Um, so far you've answered them. <clears throat> so far. Also, if you felt like you learned something, feel free to, uh, purchase a class ticket on our oh, yeah. website. So we don't require that anyone pays, um, for these classes cause we want them to be available to anyone. But if you have the ability, we have several methods on our online class, part of our uh, website where you can pay for the class. We don't expect it, but 
um, but it does help us keep doing it because, <laughs> you know, our time's valuable. Um, and so anyway, um, nobody's got any questions <clears throat> at the moment. Uh, I mean, let's take a drink for a minute and then uh, give people a chance to, because the other thing is like that we always forget is that there's a pause between us talking and the, the um, what shows up online too. So we'll give you a minute, but, um, but let uh, us know your thoughts too. Yeah. Like you can email us, text us, let us know what you thought of the class. Let us know if there's classes you're looking to like you've got interests or I don't know something yeah, yeah things you want to learn about so let us know let that us, too. let us know what you want um the cat whoa there's two cats in here and they haven't interrupted us the whole time there's three, there's three in here <laughs> I was trying to keep them out <laughs> they just want to go to bed we have five cats guys don't tell we have five cats. We have new two new kittens, which you, you probably know already, polydactyls. <clears throat> um, well, if you don't have questions, we are we have some hamburgers that are calling our names, so that's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joe, for hanging out. Yeah, thank you all for watching. And uh, well, look, someone jumped on in the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> Catch um, up. If you, this will exist online later. So um, as a video, you can watch later. So anyone who caught in the middle or later or something like that, you can uh, watch it later. Um, and uh, you can share it later too, if you want. Um, but uh, thanks for uh, for uh, following us and- um, Thanks for hanging out. Yeah, thanks for hanging out. Thanks for having a beer with us. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> all, right. all right cheers cheers thanks everybody